Good evening again, everyone. Welcome to the finals. Uh, we're going to start with our annual commissioner's press conference. Again, please uh, turn your phones off or put them on vibrate. If you have a question, raise your hand in the room. If you're on Zoom, use the raised hand function on the Zoom app. Uh, we'll start with some opening comments from the commissioner, then take questions. Adam. Thank you, Tim. Um, and it, it's great to be here, and it's great to see everyone. Um, it's been quite a while. Um, let me begin by talking a little bit about uh, this season. Um, of course, it's been now the longest season in NBA history. It was almost exactly a year ago when training camps opened. And um, as you all know, a lot has happened, um, both within the NBA family and, and of course, um, in the country. Um, this is a season where we lost um, my mentor and one of my closest friends, David Stern. You know, of course, um, tragically, Kobe Bryant, his daughter, um, and their friends. And then the pandemic. And so on uh, March 11th, as we all know, we shut down. And then we embarked on a course over the next several months of how it is and, and if we would be able to restart NBA basketball. And there were, there were three themes we focused on. Number one, of course, was, you know, can we bring the NBA back? Number two was the health and safety of everyone involved. And that meant all the stakeholders in the NBA, players, coaches, media members, of course, was there a possibility of having fans? All of that was on the table. And then as events unfolded in the country, social justice became one of those themes as well. And so those were the three main factors that were all in consideration when ultimately we decided to play here in Orlando. And that was a decision we made essentially in mid-May. And just given the unpredictability of this virus, as we all now know, at the time we made that decision in mid-May, Florida had one of the lowest case rates in the country. And by the time we arrived here in early July, it had one of the highest case rates in the country. So that was something, of course, we were dealing with as well. Being here has taken extraordinary sacrifices by everyone involved. Um, of course, there were the 22 teams that started here, but it was really a 30-team endeavor. I mean, it was the agreement of those eight teams that ultimately they would not be joining us in Orlando, which was enormous sacrifice on their part. And as you all know, they are now, in essence, operating in their own mini bubbles for their training camps. Um, there were the sacrifices of the players, the coaches, the staff who are here, those who left their families behind, their friends, who um, gave up a lot of their liberties, just as many of you have, by living on this campus. There are the 6,500 people in this community in Orlando who've been servicing the people here on this campus. It's an extraordinarily high number, something I think beyond what anyone would realize from the outside. I mean, I analogize it a bit to when you go to a movie and you see the actors on the screen and then the credits start rolling at the end and they keep rolling and they keep rolling. That's the 6,500 people and it's, the essential workers, the people who um, do our testing every day, take our temperatures, clean our rooms, you know, maintain these facilities. It's the bus drivers, you know, it's the hotel workers. It's everyone who's been involved down here and a, and a huge thank you, you know, to the people of Orange County, Florida, who've taken such good care of us over our time here. I mean, there, there are um, several thank yous, and, uh, and I made a list. I'm sure I'm leaving some names off, but, but a few I wanted to be sure I focused on. First of all, um, from the Disney company, um, Bob Iger, who's now the executive chairman of Disney, 
Um, this certainly would not have happened without him. I think when he and I first started discussing this in May, it seemed truly a pipe dream, even this notion that there would be something called a bubble that we would play in, that there would be these protocols. I think he may have said to me, are you serious? And um, I wasn't really initially, um, it wasn't my idea, and I, I resisted it, frankly. I said, I, it's just not realistic. And given the number of games we wanted to play, but somehow it came together. Um, Bob Chapik, um, the CEO of Disney, was a huge supporter of this. Josh DeMero, who's chairman of all the parks. Jeff Valley, who's the president of this park of Disney World. A huge thank you to all of you. And Roz Durant, many of you know, she was formerly of ESPN where we first met, and then she got promoted into a senior vice president role at Disney, and she's been our day-to-day -day contact here, and she's made all this happen. I want to thank Alex Martins, who's the CEO of the Orlando Magic. Um, he was one of the initial people, too, when there were some rumors in the media of other cities we were considering. He, of course, called me and said, but you are focused on Orlando. And honestly, I wasn't initially. And so Alex, on behalf of his community, and has a strong relationship with the Disney folks. They wear the name on their uniforms. Um, he was someone who pushed hard and knows this community well. And so thank you to Alex. Um, from the Players Association, of course, Michelle Roberts, the executive director. She's been our partner in everything we've done down here. Um, Chris Paul, the president of the Players Association, you know, I think from, from the, the night we shut down on March 11th, of course, um, the initial um, case, um, positive test was in Oklahoma City, you know, where they were playing that night against the Utah Jazz. So, you know, I, we begun talking that night and have been talking virtually daily ever since. Um, there are two other players um, on their executive committee I'd also like to single out. Um, that is Kyle Lowry, of course, the Toronto Raptors, and Dwight Powell um, from the Dallas Mavericks. Um, those three players, Chris, um, Kyle and Dwight, um, had a weekly call with a group of us at the league office. And, um, you know, those were in that small group where we could have, you know, really honest, direct conversations with each other um, about understanding truly the needs of the players, of the teams, of the league. And I, I want to thank those um, three players in particular, together with their executive committee. I'm from the NBA. Um, my, my partner, colleague, Mark Tatum, uh, our chief operating officer, deputy commissioner, who's, who's here and spent much of the summer down on the campus here. Thank you personally, Mark. Uh, Byron Spruell, you know, our chief of basketball operations, who's uh, you know, been down here the entire time as well. Um, they've really made this happen um, from a league stand, standpoint. A few others. Um, the media here who are in Orlando know these folks well because they're day-to-day -day roles. Um, Kelly Flato, who um, is head of our events. I mean, she's in essence the concierge of this community. Um, you know, everything from making sure the buses run on time to those of you in this room who requested feather pillows, I know who you are, I've got the list. I, I know all the personal requests that everyone here has made. Flat water, bubbly water, I know it all. So Kelly you, has been remarkable. David Weiss, many may not know him, but um, he has taken on the role of sort of chief of medical protocol at the league office. And he's not a doctor, but he's, but he's in essence a scientist and has become one. And he's become an expert on everything about um, COVID-19, about the virus, about testing. And, uh, you know, he um, in essence designed you know, together with a panel of doctors, much of the protocol we're operating under. And just a few others real quickly. Um, Dr. David Ho, he was someone, many of you may remember him, that when I got to the NBA in the early 90s, he was the lead HIV AIDS researcher. Um, and I think, you know, Magic Johnson is credited, Dr. Ho was saving his life. And he was someone that I have maintained a personal relationship with over all of these years. Um, and coincidentally, we ran into each other at a Brooklyn Nets game in January, um, when people were beginning to hear about this coronavirus in China. And I was telling him what I was hearing from our offices in China. And again, this is what he does. So he, um, he now at Columbia University was already studying this virus in his lab. 
And then he, beginning at that point in January, um, became um, our lead scientist expert in helping us navigate through this virus. So and a personal thank you to Dr. Ho and um, just two more. Um, Dr. John DeFiore, he's the chief of medical um, operations for the league, and Leroy Sims, many of you know as well, Dr. Sims. Um, those two doctors, uh, league physicians, who've really taken care of everyone on campus and uh, have, have been truly remarkable um, in just their commitment um, to everyone's health and well-being. Um, lastly, of course, I want to congratulate the Miami Heat, you know, the Los Angeles Lakers, to the Arison family, Pat Riley, Eric Spolstra, Eric Spolstra just, you know, fantastic um, what, what you've accomplished this season. And to the Lakers, um, Jeannie Buss, you know, one of the Buss family, longest standing family ownership groups in the league. And, and I should say Jeannie and um, Mickey Arison have both um, been sort of in the group of owners that um, have, I've been in regular touch with and, you know, been sort of great advisors throughout this whole process. Uh, Rob Palinka, the general manager, you know, of course, Frank Vogel, um, done an incredible job coaching. And so here we are. On the eve of Game 1, um, you all here have been here watching this basketball. Um, it's been historic, I think, not just because of the circumstances we're playing in, but the quality of the competition on the floor, the individual player performances, and I think that this is the, now back to basketball. This is hugely anticipated. We have a global audience. I'm really looking forward to it. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, we'll start with our first question. On your far left, Tim Reynolds of the Associated Press. Thanks for the bubbly water before I forget. So, um, you've referenced many times, and so has Michelle, that this was an extraordinary cooperative effort to get to tonight, to get to July 30th in the first place. Going forward, how would you identify some of the challenges that you guys are going to have to continue that spirit of cooperation in, and how soon do you think that process will begin as far as figuring out the revenue, figuring out all the dirty details that before you, have, before you get into next season? Thank you. Yeah, sure, Tim. The, the process has begun already. In fact, we identified, and this goes back, you know, probably to July when, in talking to our teams, they, they actually said to the league office, you're all working so hard, we want to make sure that you're also focused on next season. And so within the league office, one of my colleagues, Amy Brooks, has been leading a separate team focused just on that, on, on what next season will look like, when the appropriate time is to start, what the protocol should be. I think we all know nothing has really changed in this virus, as far as I know. You know, in fact, many states are beginning, I think the majority of states right now, cases are ticking back up again. You know, there's predictions about combination flu and, and coronavirus season, what that will mean. People are moving back indoors. Um, in some cases, people are, have, you know, COVID fatigue and, you know, aren't following the same protocols. And so, in many ways, we're looking at a lot of the same factors we looked at determining what to do this season. There, are, there is advancements clearly in the treatment of people once they get the disease. I'm, I'm hopeful that as we continue to, to study um, advancements in testing, that, for example, rapid testing could make a big difference in terms of our ability to potentially get fans in buildings. I think to identify quickly a player who is positive, sort of we're seeing that in the NFL right now. I mean, watching closely what's happening with that protocol. Um, can they play through it? You know, how will that work? Will there be additional spread once they've identified a player that has it? So all, those are all the things we're looking at. And as you know, I mean, there's, in terms of um, Michelle and the players as our partners, because by definition, everything we're doing exists outside of the agreement in, our, in, in the current collective bargaining agreement. We need to negotiate everything when training camp starts, when we start, um, how we're going to um, continue operating, you know, potentially under re reduced BRI, frankly. So, so those discussions are ongoing. I, my sense is, e even though um, we've been at it with them for quite some time, g given where we are, game one of the finals, and that you know, roughly two weeks from now we'll be done, um, I don't think those conversations are going to ha happen in sort of in as intense a fashion as they ultimately will need to, probably until we're finished down here. 
But I think we all understand the essential parameters. And in some of those conversations I mentioned earlier that, that I'm also having with individual players that we all are, um, I think everybody understands, just like in the country, there's public health considerations, but the economy is a public health issue as well, working and trying to strike that right balance. And so in, in this case, I, I think part of my job is to study what's happening in other industries, what other leagues are doing, including international soccer leagues. So all of that's on the table right now. We'll go with Mark Spears from the Undefeated. Yes, Adam. Um, oh, sorry. Um, when the boycott happened, uh, two questions. When the boycott happened, how did you find out about it and, and how did you help get things back on course? The second thing, when you talk to owners, what were the biggest challenges and biggest triumphs in getting Black Lives Matter on the floor and getting all the social justice jerseys and, and everything from a social justice standpoint that we're seeing here? Number one, I, I prefer not to refer to it as a boycott. I mean, to me, a boycott is when your employees or, 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 or a group of people are seeking through economic leverage to change the conduct of somebody. I, I felt in this case, in our partnership with the players, I understood how, and, and, and after the fact, understood more about how it unfolded with the Milwaukee Bucks, but I never viewed this as necessarily aimed at the league. I think there was a, a larger message that the players wanted to make here. So, you know, I, I, I prefer to view it as, as a work stoppage. I found out about it um, as it was happening in real time. I, I, there, of course, had been rumors, many of you in this room had, had written earlier in the day that there was some contemplation. I was on the phone earlier in the day with Chris, who, of course, Chris Paul, who was here at the time. I was on the phone with Michelle, um, who was, was then and still is here. And I think it was the sense earlier in the day that the games were going to play on that night. And, and, and as we all now know, that there was, an, there was a spontaneous aspect to it. Certainly people had thought about it. So I was um, at home, but colleagues who were here were in the arena. And again, as, as we all now know, certainly Orlando Magic did not know this was happening because they were on the floor warming up. Um, but then I was called and told um, Milwaukee Bucks are not coming out of their locker room. And then... I think for the next, you know, two days or so, it was pretty much around the clock talking to groups of players, groups of team executives who were here, groups of governors who weren't here. So, and, and we just were seeking to work through the issues. In terms of um, the social justice messages, um, Black Lives Matter on the court, um, the, the, the words that are on the jerseys, um, that was something that was initiated um, by the Players Association. Again, as I said earlier, you know, there were really three factors, and one of them in, in terms of how it was that we would restart, and social justice was one of them. And I'd say, to me, certainly it began with what's important to our players is important to us, but it wasn't just our players. I, I, I think and the, the players know, and the NBA community knows, there's, there's a long history in this league of fighting for social justice, for racial equality, and um, it seemed appropriate. You know, I, I, and these were decisions that were made, um, you know, quickly, um, you know, in terms of standing up this restart. It was, again, I, I think there was some misunderstanding around some of the messages, sort of that there was a sense of, of censorship that why aren't there these other messages, but these were, messages that were proposed by the players through the Players Association and agreed to after some discussion with the league. And, and, and I've, se I've said since then that, you know, I viewed this as extraordinary circumstances. And um, I, I understand, put aside the substance of the message, there are a lot of fans, especially given all that's going on in the world right now, who look to sports as a respite. And, and my response is that Again, I'm listening, and, and I understand that point of view too, but these are unique times. And I, and I think that given the circumstances, I, I, I still firmly believe it was and is the right thing to do. Right in front of me, Jeff Zilgit with USA Today. Adam, 
what does next season realistically look like for you as far as a start date, a end date, and will there be fans at the beginning, limited fans? And I know I'm getting it a lot, but you know, how much can the league withstand to not have fans in arenas for a portion of next season? Jeff, um, first of all, great to see you. It's been a long time. Uh, I don't know the answer to most of your questions. I mean, I, I, I've said previously that the earliest we would start at this point is Christmas. I mean, that's been a traditional tentpole day for the league, but it may come and go. Um, it, it's, you know, and I've, I've also said probably the greater likelihood is we'll start in January. But remember, if we start in January, it means training camps have begun roughly three weeks earlier. And part of the consideration is that for these players, as I said, at the Open, in the longest season in the history of the NBA, many of them have continued training, you know, throughout the break. Finals will end in roughly mid-October, and they need a break physically and mentally. There's no question about that. And so that gets us clearly into December. And, you know, so, as I said, Christmas the earliest, more likely January. As for fans, in seats. It's, it's certainly our goal, but it's dependent on some additional advancements. Um, rapid testing may be the key here. Um, you know, there's, a, there's, think of where we start. I mean, remember when we were first coming in Orlando, one of the biggest considerations, and, and we talked openly about this, was will there be sufficient testing? We're now at the point just in Florida, where you know, roughly a quarter of the population of the state has now been tested. You know, over five million people in this, in this state have been tested. So there appears to be ample testing, but in terms of the traditional you know, PCR test, the test that many of you are doing that, that you take and come back the next day, the question is, will there be truly rapid tests, point of care testing, don't get sent to a lab, instant results? There's a lot out there. That the, the, there, there are a lot of pharmaceutical companies very focused on that. There's a huge marketplace for that. So we're somewhat dependent. Um, David Weiss, who I mentioned earlier, is, 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 along with Dr. David Ho, are leading our own research efforts. We've been part of an initiative called Saliva Direct, working with Yale University. So we've been active in that area as well. And I think we'll see. And I think it's why I mentioned also earlier, look what happened between our decision to come here in May and then July. I think you know, a lot could change between now and then. And I think, as I said, we'll, we'll learn from the other leagues as well. First row in the middle, Rachel Nichols, ESPN. This is Hi, Adam. Hey, Welcome. Rachel. Welcome to Thank the you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, very short follow-up on Jeff and then a broader question. Um, just to follow up on that, you've talked about sort of the start and it may be moving a bit. Is there a date on the other end where you feel like you have to begin so that you have delivering to a television audience? And then my broader question is just, what have you learned? No one's ever done anything like this before, uh, really in the country, much less in sports. And, and what have you learned from these past two or three months that you are gonna apply going forward? Thanks, Rachel, and great to see you as well. Um, in terms of your first question, um, that the issue becomes, and the players have raised this as well, in addition to desire of many players to have some normalcy in the summer, I mean, they have families, kids, you know, and, and understandable and trying to find the right balance. The question is, but well, when do we get back on cycle? And I think even though there's been discussions about us potentially on a regular basis, you know, post COVID playing well into the summer, I think we're learning a little bit more about our television audience as we are experimenting. And part of it is, Fewer people are watching television in the summer, different competitions, especially when you get into the fall with the NFL, college football, and all that. So that's all into the mix as well. I would say, you know, your network, ESPN, has been great, as has Turner. I, it's just because there's such highly unusual circumstances, everyone has said, well, all rules are off. Let's just figure out what makes sense. So, I, I, you know, there is the issue of the Olympics. I've talked a little bit about that, but part of even Factoring that as a consideration, it's not absolutely clear what's happening, going to happen with the Olympics. And so, we're, but, you know, again, we have to strike the right balance there. In terms of um, what we've learned, I think first and foremost that what, and, and really it's a message, you know, I don't want to sound too grandiose, but 
to the country, and that is that the basic protocols that we're all following are working. I mean, the testing is only needed to demonstrate that at this point, that by wearing a mask, by exercising um, appropriate protocols, hand washing, um, you know, appropriate, anti you know, clean cleanliness, etc. You know, um, you know, by retain, maintaining physical distance, as if the cameras can show, as you are all sitting in this room, that's what's working. And what's different for the NBA, and we knew this setting out, that there are many industries. Certainly, when we're back at the league office and we've reopened, we can go into the office and work the same way all of you are here, and we can be physically distant, and it does make a difference. I mean, for as great as all this video technology is, it makes a difference. It's wonderful to see all of you. It does make a difference. But what our athletes are doing are taking off their masks and breathing each other's air. And that's where, you know, as, as we're seeing this in the NFL too, that you need to test on a regular basis. Not because the testing obviously prevents anyone from getting it, but it's going to by quickly isolating that player, it's going to avoid spread and avoid infecting others as well. So I think we're learning that it can be done, that you can strike a balance, you know, between public health and economic necessity. And, that, and that's what we're seeing, you know, in this country, that um, they're all valid and that it's, it's not just whatever the scientists say and it's not just whatever... The politicians say, I mean, ultimately, the people in government have to make these decisions, but all of these are public health issues, not just COVID-19. On your left, Chris Haynes from Yahoo Sports. Hey, Adam. Hey, Chris. Um, when we first started, it seemed like bi-weekly we were getting updates on COVID test results uh, from the campus, and then they just stopped. I want to say it's been well over a month. We haven't gotten any updates. Is there any reason behind why that ceased? This is Mike Bass, our head of communications. I don't know why they stopped. No, I, like, honestly, I think they stopped because we had no new news to report. I mean, and, and you know, it, we have had zero cases, as you all know, because you're here, you would have heard, you know, among players, among um, league, um, uh, among, um, you know, team staff, you know, working on campus, that, that this program is working. I should say, it, it, it doesn't mean there have been no positive cases, as I mentioned earlier, there are 6,500 people working um, to stand up this campus, and many of them go on and off the campus, and many of them are not tested on, on a regular basis. There's a program, there's voluntary testing, and some of them have tested positive. I think it just demonstrates that these protocols we're all following are working. The fact that somebody could test positive, be isolated, get treated, and haven't infected others, and, and with a bit of luck, honestly, too. I, I, that's why, I mean, you know, in, in t until we, you know, whenever these finals end, you know, we always have to recognize that something could happen. I don't anticipate it, and everything's worked well, but it's just how, how vigilant everybody has to continue being on this campus. Okay, we're going to take a couple questions from our media friends on Zoom. Michael Grange with Sportsnet. Adam, uh, thanks for taking the question. Um, the NBA is an international league. There is a border in play. And as you look forward to next year, how much consideration has the team you've had working on next year given to what uh, you maybe needed to take into consideration for the, the, the U.S.-Canadian border? It, 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 it's, it's a good question, although there, there's not a lot we can do about it. I mean, it's interesting, you know, to, to Canada's credit, I mean, they've approached this in a certain way, and it seems like they found a, a fair balance between their health and safety considerations and, and their economic needs, and they've had an extraordinarily low case rate. And, and they've been extremely cautious sort of in their rules, and, and obviously baseball hasn't played a single game there as a result. So um, Larry Tannenbaum, who's the, the, the governor of the Toronto Raptors, um, is also our chairman of the board. So it, it, it's something we've been very focused on. And I think just to the earlier questions, we're gonna to have to wait and see. Obviously, it's, it's one of those things that's gonna be outside of our control. And if, if you know, we, we, you know, I know it's, you know, Larry has had ongoing conversations as has Masai Ujiri 
with government officials in Canada to see um, how they're going to be looking at things this fall, but, but it's just too early to know. I mean, but, but we're, we will obviously have to work with wh whatever rules we're presented with there. Also Thank on you. Zoom, Thank you. Bon Tips with ESPN. Adam, to go back to what Tim Reynolds said at the beginning, um, when you were talking about the possibility of lower BRI next year and the negotiation with, with the players, do you have any expectations of, uh, of any labor issues between now and the start of the next season? I don't have any expectations uh, of labor issues, I think, in the way you're suggesting it, meaning that we won't be able to resolve them. There's no doubt there are issues on the table that need to be negotiated. I think it's, um, you know, we've managed to work through every other issue so far. I think we have a, a, a constructive relationship with them. We share all information. We look at our various business models together. So, I, you know, I, I think while no doubt there will be issues and, and there will be some difficult negotiations ahead, I, I, I fully expect we'll work them out as we always have. Also from Zoom, Mark Medina, USA Today. This is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Adam, good to see you. Yep. Um, so, uh, you mentioned about some of the safety protocols and the rapid testing. Um, do you see a vaccine as a prerequisite to having games with fans, or do you think that there's ways to work around that if there isn't a proven and safe vaccine by the time you hope the season can start? Yeah. Based on everything I've read, there's almost no chance that there'll be a vaccine, at least that is widely distributed, before we start the next season. So I, I do not see the development of, of a vaccine as a prerequisite. You know, my, my sense is that it, with rapid testing, if you, it may not be that we'll have 19,000 people in the building, we'll see, but that with appropriate protocols in terms of distancing and with advanced testing that you will be able to bring fans back into arenas. Again, um, it's early days, uh, you know, and, and many of these decisions, I mean, to the earlier question about what's Canada going to do, I mean, we also have to deal with state by state, and in some cases city by city restrictions on how many people can gather as well. But uh, again, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that based on what we're learning, based on protocols, based on testing, we will be able to have games with fans um, next season prior to full distribution of a vaccine. I'm going to take a few more in the room here. Dan Weike with Los Angeles Times. Hi, Adam. Um, there are two teams here, 28 teams that aren't, um, that are looking for direction in this offseason in terms of what the salary cap is going to look like, when the draft is going to be, when free agency is going to start. H how soon do those questions need to be answered for those teams? Well, as, as you know, we, ha we have posted a date f for the draft. I mean, there's a, a little asterisk next to it saying it possibly could change, but, but, you know, that date has been essentially locked in. We're targeting that. And we understand in terms of operating a team, they don't necessarily need to know what the cap and tax are exactly, because they never do. Obviously, the, the, the draft always comes in June before we set the cap and tax, but they have a pretty good idea because of the guidance we provide them throughout the season. So in this case, we recognize we need to be in a position to give them guidance. Maybe we won't be completed on everything that we need to work out with the Players Association, but that guidance will come, and it's going to come based on discussions we're going to have with the play we're having with the Players Association on, on, on how to set the cap and tax. And I'll just add that, you know, it's, because it's such a, a unique time, this almost, almost by definition, as I said earlier, Everything we're doing is outside of the collective bargaining agreement because if we just went by the formula in the collective bargaining agreement, we'd have a huge reduction in the cap and tax. And not only would it create havoc in terms of planning purposes f for our teams, but I think roughly a third of the league will be free agents. And so there would be enormous inequity there because there'd be no cap room for those players to sign contracts. So I think this is where you know, the Players Association also has to work through issues among themselves and sort of an equitable distribution in terms of wherever, what, what, whatever the pool of salary is that we have to distribute next year. So again, you know, I, I, I think to, you know, the earlier questions, the, these are, these issues are, are a bit complicated and, um, and, and difficult in many cases, but no reason to believe that 
you know, with our counterparts at the Player Association that we won't be able to work through them just as we have all, all the other issues that are allowing us to play right now. Behind Dan, we got Gary Washburn from the Boston Globe. Hey, Adam. Hey, Gary. Uh, with Nate McMillan, Alvin Gentry, and Doc Rivers losing their jobs, you're down to four African-American coaches. And secondly, the hiring of Steve Nash, there was kind of a perception that it was a kind of a good old boys network thing. What can the league do about the only having four African-American coaches? And what should teams to be able to hire who they want? Should there be a Rooney rule? How should this go? The answer is ultimately yes to should the teams be able to hire who they want. I, I, I don't see a way to operate a league where the league office, the commissioner is dictating to a team who they should or shouldn't hire or, should they, or they, who they should or shouldn't fire, frankly. That's the, the other side of the coin. Having said that, I know we can do better. Um, we have six openings right now. We're in discussions with all of those teams about making sure there's a diverse slate of candidates. Um, you know, we've looked at what might be an equivalent to a, a Rooney-type rule in the NBA, and I'm, I'm not sure it makes sense. I mean, I, I'm open-minded if there are other ways to address it. Um, there, there is a certain natural ebb and flow to the hiring and firing, frankly, of coaches, but, you know, it, the number's too low right now. And again, I, I think we should, let's talk again after we fill these, these six positions and see where we are. Because I, 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 I know we can do better and I think we will do better. I'm gonna take two more. We're gonna start with Sam Amick. Hi hey, Adam, athletic. good to see you. Hey Sam. Help the family. I almost didn't recognize you. Right? <laughs> Vader mask. Yeah. I wonder um, from a personal level, it wasn't that long ago when you were sitting at the Sloan Conference talking about the mental health of your players. And then here we are, in this environment where the mental health challenges have been pretty well chronicled. You had Paul George talking about his struggles. Michael Malone was frustrated with the family situation. Um, knowing how invested you are with the whole group, just how has that element sat with you? What observations have you made? And, and you know, do you think that was handled the way you would like to uh, have had it handled? Number one, I, I'm extraordinarily proud of those players coaches, uh, team execs, for their willingness to talk openly about those issues. A lot has changed since I sat on that stage at that Sloan conference, you know, with Bill Simmons talking about these issues. And it was, it was, it got a lot of attention, I think, when I did then, because, you know, um, Kevin Love had begun talking about DeMar DeRozan, but, but it wasn't something players were generally talking about. And so much credit goes to those two guys, because Teams have radically shifted in their approach to mental wellness. You know, there there have been significant number of new positions at teams to focus on these issues. And to me, it's step one, you need to be able to talk about these things. And so, and many players have talked about those issues here that have become, um, you know, amplified, you know, in, in because of the community everyone here is living in, but many of those issues pre-existed living in, in this bubble. So number one, I think just ability to address it and, and everyone here knows when you're living on this campus, you fill out a health survey every day and there's, there's only two or three questions. And one of the questions is, do you need to talk to someone you know, about, about mental health? And so I'm proud of that as the league, that that's a huge advancement. Now to the substance, maybe even more importantly. You know, I, so I did hear from many members living down in this community that they needed their family members here um, sooner. They needed us to liberalize the rules in terms of allowing friends and family members on. We did make some adjustments, but it's, I, as I was saying earlier, these are just, it's all a balancing act. Like there, there was no doubt if you talk to our panel of scientists, doctors, experts, they say, especially when you start introducing new people into the environment, um, as the season went on, the playoffs went on, you were introducing additional risk. On the other hand, you had the mental wellness of people who um, were separated from partners, spouses, children for long periods of time. And, and, and so it did weigh heavily on me. 
you know, ultimately have to take responsibility for those decisions. I think as I was saying earlier, it's not, you can't say it's just the doctors and it, it's not just the teams who make these decisions. Ultimately, it's, it's, it's my job to balance all, all of these factors. And as I said, so we, we made some adjustments as we went. And I think it also helped me realize that um, people can all, like these are extraordinary circumstances this, that, and I think a lot of people view this as once in a lifetime. But now as we look to next season and that what's changed, you know, will we be able to operate sort of as the NFL is right now, for example, where guys play and they go home at night and they're with their families and they get tested. So that's something we're looking at. Um, are, will we need to operate in some sort of bubble or campus? And if we did, or maybe for a portion of the season, and how reasonably long now that people have experienced it, um, you know, can people really continue and thrive in this environment? I mean, one of the reasons many of the other players who are here wanted the eight teams who didn't experience Orlando, in essence, to play in mini bubbles of their own is that, so that when they came together as a players association, there was at least a common base of facts so that everyone, as they were collectively making those decisions, had a sense of the sacrifices that, that, that come with playing in an environment like this. So as I said, I mean, I, I'm hoping, ideally, we would not return to a bubble environment, but it's, it's something we're going to have to continue looking at. We'll close with one last question on Zoom from Davide from La Gazzetta Cello Sport. Hey, Commissioner, uh, it's great to see you, even if just virtually. Um, Thank you. You said, you said each of the bubble was unrealistic, and now it's probably an example of how to do things during the pandemic from a sports point of view. Uh, which is the thing you're most proud of, of what you guys accomplish? Well, thank you for the question, first of all. I, I'd say I'm most proud that we collectively came together as a community and pulled this off. And, and by that I mean all of the stakeholders. I mean the players, the team governors, 30 teams, not just 22 teams. The support we received from our fans, you know, who've been, of course, watching these games and participating in social media. Our team communities, both back home where the teams play and the community here, the greater community in Orlando who's been participating. I mean, it's, and especially, frankly, given all the division in our country right now, it's, it's just the fact that people could set their minds to something, come together, make enormous sacrifices, compromise. This required a lot of compromise on everybody's part and, 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 and then pull this off. You know, again, I'm, 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 there's always this, you know, because we have two weeks left, but you know, it, it's, it's something that everyone should share in um, the, 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 the pride that, uh, of, of the sense that, that we've accomplished this, you know, against many obstacles. And, and, and at a time, you know, also when I, I think people needed to see this, and, and I'll just maybe end with this comment that, you know, it, sort of one of the bedrock principles always of this league you know, has been to inspire people and to bring people together. And, and hopefully we have inspired people that by seeing these players on the floor, you know, despite, you know, missing their families and um, playing in isolation and, and, you know, turmoil in their communities and social justice issues, that they're doing their jobs and and they're making it work. I think that that is inspiring. And I think it's also an opportunity to see people come together through the commonality of sports. That it's, it's something that, especially given the, the, the last questioner, that, that fact is this is something that people are following globally. This isn't just a, uniquely a US issue. And it's something at a time of a pandemic that's affecting Everyone in the world, people can have that commonality of, of loving NBA basketball. So I, I, I'd say those are the things I'm most proud of.